seminar in our series for the Advanced Transportation Technologies Seminar Series. My name is Stephanie Malinoff. I'm the Program Director for the Roadway Safety Institute, who's the organization sponsoring the seminar series. Max Donath, our center's, or I'm sorry, our institute's director is not able to be here today, so he sends his regards. And as I told Professor Lindsay, you're stuck with me today instead of Max. For those of you who have been to a seminar before, you know, you know, the logistics, but let me give just a few housekeeping comments. In addition to the folks here in the room, we also have a live audience watching via a webinar. Uh, folks who are on the webinar, we do ask that you sign in to the webinar. And I'm going to, there you go. See, there's a little comment bubble in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you could click on that and then sign in in the box that pops up. Let us know your name, your organization, and how many people are viewing the webinar from your location so that we can track that data for future uh, webinars. Let's see. For those of you in the room, we do have a schedule of future seminars if you're interested in seeing the entire series. For those of you watching online, that information is also available on our, on our website at roadwaysafety.umn.edu. Students who are in the classroom, make sure you see Kylie at the end of session. She has your reports from the first week to hand back to you. She may have grabbed some of you already before um, the seminar started, but if you haven't seen her, see her before you leave today. Also, for those of you in the room, we're going to send around a sign-in sheet, maybe, I don't know, a few minutes or halfway through the seminar. Everybody who's in the room, we ask that you sign in, whether you're a student attending the class or not. Please make sure you get signed in so that we know who is here. And then at the end, we'll go through a few other housekeeping comments about PDH forms, etc. But let me turn it over to Professor Greg Lindsay. He is here today to talk to us about performance measures for pedestrian and bicycle safety, countermeasures, I'm sorry, challenges in monitoring traffic and assessing exposure to risk. Professor Lindsay is with the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, and for those of you who are online, I appreciate your presence, presence as well. As Stephanie said, we're going to talk today about challenges in measuring uh, volumes of bicycle and pedestrian traffic and how we think about that relative to risk. This is a Roadway uh, Safety Institute project. As you know, the RSI is, is new, and so this is, in one sense, prospective. But what, we'll try, what I'll try to do today is draw on some of the work that we've, we've accomplished thus far that form a context uh, for this research. Uh, so here's what I'd like to uh, go over in today's seminar. I'd like to talk very briefly about the motivation. And there I'm really going to focus on uh, just a brief overview of, of, of a few basic stats about bike and ped crashes. I want to put this in the context of work at the Minnesota Department of Transportation because the work that I'm doing um, is, is really aimed at how we improve practice. And I want to talk about uh, the goals that transportation agencies have and, and, and put this work in that context of how it can further those. Um, this is a specific project of the RSI, and I'll talk about those, those, framework, uh, those objectives. I'll give a brief framework, and then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about uh, recent work that, or, and work that's ongoing in the state to develop better measures of bicycle and pedestrian traffic. I'll give examples of a couple approaches to how we model traffic and I'll talk about uh, next steps in the research. Uh, and this, this project is about a two-year project so um, uh, we hope to have co uh, contributed in this area over time. Basic information. This graph is from the Minnesota Crash Facts. It's the Department of Public Safety that tracks accidents based on police reports. So it's partial collection of data. It doesn't include data that don't uh, bike and ped crashes that don't have um, that don't have uh, uh, vehicles involved. But basically, it gives you the broadest picture. We have uh, historically between about 850 and 1,000 bike and ped crashes per year. A few more bike crashes than ped crashes. Most ped Crashes result in injuries. Um, at, uh, most bikes uh, do as well, but a, a few of them do not. And over f four to one percent, uh, respectively, of ped and bike crashes result in fatalities. So one of the questions is, how do we analyze and develop our transportation systems to minimize uh, these these crashes, these injuries, and these fatalities? One of the things to understand is that bike and ped uh, crashes vary over time and in space. And so again, these are, basic, these are basic stats, but what you can see is different temporal patterns throughout the year. 
for bike and bike and um, ped crashes. You see much more seasonality with bicycle crashes. You see that peak in the summer. This is typical, and later we'll look at volume data that sees this. So we draw inferences fairly soon that the number of crashes are associated with when people are walking and biking. This just illustrates the same type of phenomena, but instead of over the course of a year, this graph shows the number of bike and ped crashes in Minnesota last year by time of day. And again, you see a little bit different patterns, but a concentration of those in late afternoon. So what we've seen is late, late fall, uh, larger proportion numbers of crashes, late, late afternoon numbers of crashes. And the question is, how do we begin to understand these, and how do we measure these? These are from police reports. The question is, how do we relate that to what we see on the road? Um, we also see different across space, and I've broken this out by uh, city population size. And we see that most crashes occur in communities over 100,000. There are about, these are in, in bureaucratic parlance, there are, these are called class one cities. You'd have Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, in, this, in the next class, you'd have places like Mankato. As you go further down, 10 to 24,000 communities like Bemidji. And most of our communities in this state, there are 850 municipalities, are less than town thousand. But you can see that there's not equal distribution across cities of size. So it gives a little bit of information there. Other information is available from Crash Facts that helps us understand contributing factors. So basic background is pedestrian crashes, um, bike crashes, those attributed to motor vehicle drivers are, are similar. Failure to yield right of way, driver inattention, or vision obscured. And those are the basic factors that have helped contribute to these. Bicyclists cause some crashes as well. Failure to yield right of way, non-motorist error, disregarding traffic controls. Uh, I, I imagine we've all seen cyclists uh, run a red light. Um, and sometimes cyclists themselves are distracted. So we can understand, we get basic data from, from um, police reports of accidents about factors that cause those. So we understand something about crashes in particular places, but one of the questions is, how do we, how do we understand the volumes of ped and, uh, pe pedestrian and bicycle traffic, and how can we relate, use that knowledge to understand and prevent those types of crashes? So that's sort of the, sort of the state of, of last year's accidents. Um, and we see, we, see some, we see some evidence from the first one that the number of bike and ped crashes have declined slightly over the last decade. They've declined on the order of 1% or 2% per year. Um, another useful piece of context has to do with transportation policy and planning in the state. The Minnesota Department of Transportation has a set of strategic directions. In its 2050 vision, this is its overall plan that's sort of dictating policy, and that is to support multimodal systems. In other words, MnDOT's policies and plans call for an increase in the amount of bicycling and pedestrian work. Right? There's also statutes and policy encouraging the development of complete streets. Complete streets would involve making streets um, uh, so that they support vehicle, bicycle, and pedestrian traffic simultaneously. What this does is it potentially increases interaction for bicyclists and pe pedestrians with motor vehicle traffic. Um, so while, we're, while the state is actively encouraging bicycling and, and walking as by policy and by investment, um, they're also concerned about safety. And so there's a toward zero death uh, program. It's aimed at reducing crashes and fatalities and injuries. And the idea is to develop measures of exposure and to then evaluate the effectiveness of interventions and countermeasures to reduce safety. Lastly, under federal law, under MAP 21, agencies are responsible for developing performance measures. These include things like miles traveled. Two, two common performance measures in the vehicle world have to do with average annual daily traffic or vehicle miles traveled. And government agencies use those measures to allocate money for funding. We don't have something comparable for bikes and PEDs, but the state is interested in developing those. The state, the state doesn't have a measure of how many bicycle miles traveled in the state there are. The question is, can they move towards that? We don't know the average daily traffic, the average number of bicyclists on most road segments, nor the number of pedestrians. So the question is, how do we begin to develop those and use, those, use that information? 
Similarly, the, the state doesn't have denominators for normalizing crashes, so they, aren't, they don't know crash rates. And these are things that they're interested in trying to understand. So we have a, a problem with bike and ped crashes. We want to increase the safety of, of travel for bikes and peds. And at the government level, we want to foster that activity and track how uh, successful our events are. So those are two contexts for the work that we're going to do. This diagram just shows that there, is, there are changes in biking, bicycling and pedestrian now over time. These come from one of our doctoral students, Jesse Schoner, is analyzing travel behavior inventories that were taken by the Metropolitan Council in 2000 and 2010. And this shows mode share by month from those travel diaries in the 19 or 20 county metropolitan region. And you can see a couple of things. You can see, again, the seasonality of biking and walking by mode, which, which, which mirrors that of when crashes occur. So we've seen some correspondence here. We also see in 2001, the travel behavior inventory was only taken in the summer. In 2000, it was taken throughout the year, but both these show an increase in mode share for biking and walking over the past decade. So in this sense, while we're trying to foster um, more biking and walking, here's some evidence that there's been some success, at least in the metropolitan area. So what we have, again, are uh, efforts to foster biking and walking, interest in trying to measure it, and interest in moving forward. Now, one of the problems is that while we know biking and walking is changing, we don't have good tools or good information about where people bike and walk or volumes on particular roads. And so this RSI project is aimed at developing methodologies and tools to estimate bike and ped traffic volumes. And it's going to involve, over the next two years, a set of four case studies to illustrate a, uh, different approaches for accomplishing this objective. So this is the work we want to do, and what I'm going to do is elaborate on this a bit and then move back and talk about the work that's been done in the recent past to set the ground or the stage for this work. So what we're going to try to do in this project is collect both manual and automated bike and ped counts in our case communities. We're going to work on development of different types of extrapolation factors to try to obtain measures of average daily bicyclists and average daily pedestrians. We're going to look at regression models for non-motorized traffic on streets and sidewalks. And we want to think about those in terms of uh, a way to characterize exposure to risk. So that's sort of the four-step process. And what I'd like to do is put that in a broader framework. This framework comes from a recent paper in the journal Accident Analysis and Prevention. It's by uh, a, a professor named Shepers and a set of colleagues. And basically, he's trying to bring together factors that motivate where people go and look at specific um, uh, risks associated that road users faced and look at those and coming out in terms of crashes and in industries. We, he, he's trying to tr bring together travel behavior theory and crash risk theory. And I've, I've got one, a couple boxes up there in red because that's where our work fits in this broader framework. What we're interested in, what I'm interested in in this project is trying to determine traffic volumes, and there are a couple of ways we can get at those that we can use as exposure to risk. So we can combine that with other, other theories and analyses to do a better job of understanding and crashes and risks. Recently, we, there's been several papers uh, that have been focusing on cyclist risk. Uh, the paper in 2012 sort of summarized an overview of how people have, have characterized uh, risk of uh, exposure to risk over time. They've looked at frequency measures, for example, count accidents per year, trying to normalize that by, by capita, per cyclist or flow rate, or for distance traveled. And all those have been explored. None have been developed in the way that they're used as systematically as with vehicles. Molina et al. Um, did a paper where they looked at exposure based on 100 million pedestrian or bicycle miles traveled. And they talked about, um, he, he went through the sort of sets of procedures that had to, that had to be completed to estimate, uh, for example, that pedestrian exposure. And Miranda Morena did a paper in which they looked at exposure as a function of total bicyclist and vehicle flows 
and then develop measures for trying to dis disaggregate that at intersections by turning movements. So there's a number of places where people are developing these types of measures. We hope to build and, and work on that. But our principal focus to begin with is begin beginning on estimating bike and ped traffic. We want to distribute those traffic volumes on roadway networks and assess the aggregate risk. For that, we need traffic counts and models. Here's Minnesota's traffic monitoring program because that's the model that MnDOT is interested in trying to extend for bikes and peds. MnDOT counts vehicles at uh, over 32,000 locations across the state. There are about 1,200 short duration sites where they classify vehicles using different types of counters, including tube counters. They count on cycle lengths of one, two, up to 12 years. In other words, they, they go back to those sites. There are a number of 100 continuous counter sites, and they, and they recount uh, depending on, at, at different road segments depending on changes as they're reported over time. They historically do very little counting on small rural roads or on local urban roads. In contrast with bikes and peds, for example, the state has never monitored. So one way to conceptualize what we're trying to do is build a system analogous to this where none has existed in the past. And that presents some challenges. This just illustrates that the dashed line across the middle represents monthly traffic, monthly ADT, uh, as it, uh, the ratio of monthly traffic to ADT for I-35, you can see it's relatively constant. And again, the other represents non-motorized traffic. This is on the, the Midtown Greenway Trail. That illustrates some complexities. There are three pieces of research that have come out in the last two years that provide a context for our work. One is the Federal Highway, for the first time, included a chapter on monitoring bicycle and pedestrian traffic in its traffic monitoring guide. This is uh, considered sort of the Bible for those people who want to try to count traffic. That represents, represents a tremendous um, step forward and provides a, a framework for the practical traffic monitoring we'll be doing. The National Cooperative Highway Research Program published a, a guide this year on estimating and biking walking, and so I, I want to refer to that. And another NCHRP study, people are evaluating technologies for doing bike and ped counting, and that's forthcoming this year. So there's a lot of guidance in this area currently. The federal, the traffic monitoring guide is a, is a framework for MnDOT's support of, of recent efforts to improve bike and ped monitoring. Basically, it's aimed at developing two performance measures, average annual daily traffic and vehicle miles traveled. The approach is a network of permanent short duration monitoring sites, and we use patterns in the traffic from the continuous monitoring sites to extrapolate the short duration sites to estimate average annual daily traffic, and from that, along with road segment length, miles traveled. And the challenges adapting that have to do with traffic variability, uh, the availability of technology, and the resources to implement a new system. MnDOT's recognize that, and they're interested, and they're testing now commercially available counters that they might work with the districts and local municipalities to extend a mon monitoring system throughout the state. So they're looking at adapting pneum pneumatic tubes that are used in vehicle classification counting to get bike counts. They're looking at using inductive loops, both on trails but on roads. There are now technologies that didn't exist five or 10 years ago to count bicycles in roads and differentiate them from vehicles. They're looking at microwave counters that can be used on trails. And then they're looking at also other types of infrared technologies. So MnDOT has a project uh, to evaluate half a dozen of these different technologies. And I want to illustrate some of the challenges that they're facing in adapting these because they set sort of the foundation for moving forward and getting counts to get volumes to estimate exposure to risk. These are examples for the first time in Minnesota now. Within the past year, we've established three permanent counters for counting bicyclists in streets. There's one in Duluth, one in Egan, and one in Minneapolis up on Central Avenue. And you can see in the, the picture on my left, to be your right, the EcoCounter Zelt. This installation um, puts an inductive loop, a bicycle runs over it, the, it the, the, the metal in the bike is sensed, and it counts. This particular logger is connected to technology to send the counts back automatically towards to a server, and we can monitor this one from our desk. 
Uh, one, one thing that, one approach to trying to get counts that people are extremely interested in has to do with adapting tube counters used for vehicles to get bike counts by changing the classification algorithms. This has potential for getting widespread geographic distribution because the counts are already being taken and they just have to be adapted. We wouldn't have to put in new technologies. This has been done in Boulder County, Colorado, and a number of other places. And so we're testing some of that. And I'm going to take a deep dive into that in a second and show you some, some preliminary results. And lastly, there are these types of radio beams that can be used on trails to get mode split. Uh, historically, infrared counters that are used on trails don't differentiate bikes and peds. This type of counter does. So over the past summer, we had a couple of students, uh, one in civil engineering, one in Humphrey, who have been working with Hennepin County to begin to test to see whether or not they can get bike, uh, bike traffic counts from the tube counts that they've been using. They're looking at two different manufacturers, one uh, a company made called MetroCount and the other called uh, TimeMark. And the two locations they've tried these are University Avenue and Portland Avenue. And you can see the setups there. One, uh, University Avenue, they were deployed in two different ways. One to look at uh, a bike lane and one travel lane, and one to look at a bike lane and three travel lanes, one direction. And over in Portland Avenue in South Minneapolis, they were deployed across a, a bike lane and a travel lane. There are different classification algorithms based on axle, axle spacing and speed. The way that we did this, we collected the, we collected the tube counts, and then the minute, uh, we had the people uh, from the Minnesota Transportation Observatory videotape, we counted bikes, and we used the manual counts from the video to validate the tube counts. And what you can see here, you can see the, um, where it says percentage error, we look at the, the magnitude of error for the counts here. And we see at the Portland Avenue site, which was one travel lane and one bike lane in each direction, the percentage error from the bike tube count was, was small, less than 10%. And that varied on the classification algorithm. Different ones exist from different manufacturers. But on University Avenue, we didn't do so well. And particularly one device, the time mark, didn't work at all well. And these tube counters um, don't work at all for multiple lanes. Uh, the, the, the error rate becomes very high. It has to do with their sensitivity and the, and the pressure from the vehicle. And so you can see that if we want to try to adapt tube counts to get bike counts, we face some challenges. There's some promise, but there's also some other results. Now, one of the things we want to do is look at what type of error is this associated with. And so this is a simple plot of the, um, the metro count, hourly classification counts, the tube counts against the manual counts that derived. And we see fairly uh, strong consistency. So we know that the typical count is an undercount. And when we, when, during the video observation, uh, the, 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 the research team looked at ascertain why miscounts, why, why, why error were occurring. And it typically had to do with occlusion, bikes and uh, cars passing at the same time and only one, one vehicle or one bike being registered. And so what we've been able to do here is estimate uh, an equation that we could use to correct the bike count to bring it closer to what we think the real actual count is for that particular site. And this is an example of a way to try to adjust the counts from the tubes to better represent what is observed manually. And you can see the solid line here, the solid dark line represents the, the manual count from the traffic observatory. The dashed line represents the tube from the counter. And depending on which, which uh, way we try to correct, which algorithm we correct for, which equations we use, we can do a better job of matching. And so we can come reasonably close to tracking bike volumes in this respect. And so we think that tubes have some promise, but the results clearly are mixed. We have higher accuracy with lower traffic and fewer lanes. We can develop ways to adjust for known systematic error where we think we know the cost. Use of these tube counters is potentially cost effective because they're being deployed all across the state by MnDOT and local staff. But their applicability depends on our tolerance for error. And that's something we have to think very carefully about. And so it could be that these wouldn't be acceptable in some cases. Now, when we think about the challenge facing the state, there are no uh, standard technologies that are being used across the state. So these types of validation exercises are needed 
for all the different types of technologies that they're talking about using because we don't know how well they work in the field in the long time. So when, we, when we're thinking about going from sort of a zero monitoring base to an institutionalizing one, we have to think about how we're going to work with our technologies to produce counts because they'll be the, a foundation for some of the modeling we want to do. Um, we want to use those as, as, as inputs for modeling. And so what I want to do is to switch now to, from sort of counting to modeling and talk about another piece of work that just came out from the NCHRP. And this is a new guidance document on tools for estimating demand. And they've gone through a set of different techniques that are based on utility maximization theory, sort of in the travel behavior theory from that broad framework. And they, um, this, this, this uh, report uh, outlines these tools that planners and engineers can use. One class of tools are facility demand models, a direct demand. And those are the ones that we've had some experience here. And those where, rather than thinking about um, uh, like using survey data from individuals where they represent mode choice and things from the travel behavior types of inventories, we observe counts and we try to relate those to land use and other factors to develop a broader model. And I want to illustrate that type of an approach here. And what we've done with that is, is try to use that type of approach on a very specialized network, the trail network, uh, multi-use trail or shared use path network in Minneapolis. It's a simpler network to model. Um, and, and I'll illustrate here how we use counts to, to, to do a direct demand model. So the goal here is to develop estimates of, of uh, traffic, bike and ped traffic, on the shared use path or trail system, things like the Midtown Greenway or the East or West River Parkway. What we're going to do is illustrate counts from six reference sites, and then we, we monitored traffic for a week at 76 additional locations using infrared technologies. The technologies we use are an active infrared beam. It's when uh, a walker or a cyclist breaks the beam, an event is registered. We have, again, QAQC problems because uh, if people pass simultaneously, you get an undercount. And it's been shown that active infrared is consistently undercounts traffic. You can also have other types of bad data problems. And there, then we have the challenge of, once we have those counts, how do we, how do we extrapolate those or analyze those? then we're going to want to model those. And then the question is, how do we maintain that network? And the, the words I have here are, are collaboration and scrambling for dollars, because agencies don't have yet budgets for implementing these count programs. So this has been a demonstration. So this is a map of the trail network in the city of Minneapolis. It's about 80 miles. And you can see that much of it's connected, but some sections are not. Uh, the red line east-west across the middle of the city is the Midtown Greenway. And then you can see the trails that surround the lakes and the Grand Rounds. It's sort of the, you know, it's a world-renowned uh, park system. Uh, you might know that the Parks Board was rated by the Trust for Public Land as the best park system in the United States this past year. And it, a lot of it, whether you believe that ranking or not, is immaterial, but a lot of it's based on, on this Grand Round system. You can see three uh, or six red dots here. Those are locations where we have permanent counters. They're installed. They count traffic 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And uh, they're those active reds, active infrared. So they record uh, uh, the body's past, but they don't differentiate bikes and peds. So that's a limitation of this technology and approach. One of the, one of the things that we're interested in when we try to model uh, volumes on segments is trying to figure out how to divide segments. And so in this particular case, we worked with the park district. And we tried to develop about uh, 80 different segments, each a mile long, under the idea that once we measure that, we, we'd hope that volume might be representative of that length. We used um, a set of sort of judgmental criteria looking at different types of brakes where bike, bike lanes on streets connected to the trails to establish these. And then the goal was to go out and monitor each of those segments for a week over the summer of 2013. These are the technologies that we use. You can see we put the, the infrared devices on these yellow stanchions. Uh, we these are old technologies. Uh, we have a maximum number of events we can record of 16,000, so we're out there every few days, at least in the summertime. But we collected those year-round. We've been doing that now since about 2007. 
There are also some old inductive loop counters on the Greenway. And this, this graph is simply to illustrate the importance of quality assurance, quality control. If we have an inductive loop, it's only counting bicyclists. If we have infrared, it's counting both bicyclists and pedestrians. When we, can, when we had both at the same location, we plotted the results. We were getting higher volumes with our, with our bike counter than their infrared counter. And the reason was is that the bike counter was overcounting and the infrared counter was undercounting. You can see that plot here. And what it does is it, it illustrates the importance of validation of these commercially available de devices before you use those. And so we went through an exercise of, we spent several hundred hours in the field over time uh, man doing manual counts, relating those to the observed counts to develop these types of a, a correction equation. So we have an hourly correction factor for, um, that we apply to the counts based on the type of technology that we have. And they typically involve bumping up the volumes based on the undercount associated with occlusion. Now, this gives you an idea for our permanent reference sites, the estimated total traffic, the estimated um, average annual daily traffic, and a little bit about mode mix that we could get from, partly because in some places bikes and peds are on separate trails and other places where we had two devices. A couple things to take away here, we have orders of magnitude difference across our six reference sites. Range, and they, they're substantial. For example, there's 1.3 million people per year go around Lake Calhoun. And we look at mode mix. On the Midtown Greenway, bikes represent 85 to 95 percent of the traffic around the lakes, two-thirds pedestrians and one-third bikes. And so you see substantial mode dif difference. So that underscores the limits of the infrared technology. It also underscores the importance of using different approaches to work with bikes and peds. Now these give you the results, just basic descriptive information. You can see that there's about three orders of magnitude in the, in the northwest quadrant there. That represents the volumes at the reference sites. And you can see that there are uh, three orders of magnitude difference. And you can see the sharp summer peaks. If you look uh, over in the, in the northeast, when we normalize monthly traffic to annual average daily traffic, however, you see that they all are pretty similar. And that's important because what it began to tell us is that regardless of the volume, they're moving up and down across over time in similar ways. When we try to do that separately by bikes and peds, we see that bikes are more responsive. They have a greater summertime peak, and that also mirrors what we saw with accidents. Right? So we're starting to see some, some similarities here. Here what we look at is average daily traffic. Uh, for the year at the six monitoring sites, and you can see higher traffic on Saturdays and Sundays and uh, generally decreasing with Friday being the lower day. And we see different patterns on, around the lakes and on the greenways. And so what we're again seeing is that the similar patterns but spatially different patterns. And we need to take account of that if we're going to model. And when we look at hourly traffic, both on the weekend and weekdays, we see differences. We see on the midtown, for example, Saturday and Sunday are clearly different than the other five days. Around the lakes, you have this Friday that looks much somewhere between the weekdays and weekends. And we have, in each of these cases, we have peak traffic occurring in four to six. And if you remember our bike and ped traffic, when those accidents occurred, it was also that late afternoon. So what we're all beginning to do is seeing some similarities here. And lastly, we want to talk about how we then, if we understand these patterns of the reference sites, can extrapolate. And the, the, the picture on the, in the southeast uh, quadrant there shows daily traffic for 2013 at all six reference sites superimposed on each other. And you can see they're all moving up together. Now historically, when MnDOT takes a short duration count and extrapolates it to a road segment average annual daily traffic, it does a two-step process. It uses the information on the west side of this image, um, on your left. First it looks at day of week, and then month of year to do an extrapolation. And one of our doctoral students, uh, Steve Hankey, who's, who's, who's just graduated, worked with us to develop a different method that takes into consideration the variability of each day of year. So it's a different type of factoring extrapolation method. And then he used simulation to extrapolate and see how our accuracy was. So basically what we did is we took the, we, we compared, uh, we computed the traditional two-step process, day of week, month of year factors for five of the six reference sites. We did random selection 
of 50 different one day, three, five, seven day counts from the sixth site, we used the, the two step process and the one step day of year process to predict traffic volumes for the sixth site. And we compared the extrapolation error. What we wanted to do this was both look at whether or not considering the very Considering the variability each day gave us an improved measure, and also we're trying to get an idea of how long a short duration counts we needed to take in order to minimize extrapolation error. There had been a paper published by Kristen Nordback, who's at Portland State, um, before that used a comparable method. And what you can see here, uh, the horizontal, the, the, the X graphs has to do with the number of days we take a sample. The, the vertical axis has to do with the error that we have when we extrapolate to try to get AADT, average annual daily traffic for uh, that site based on our monitoring results. And what you can see here is that this new method works a little bit better and that if we monitor uh, up to a week, we, sort of, we get sort of an optimum trade-off between the cost of monitoring and improvement in further extrapolation. And so what sort of the, the emerging guidance for using this sort of short duration counts for, for um, short duration counts is you need samples of at least a week because you can cut the error rate and extrapolation by 8, 10%. So once that method was developed in 2013, we then, went, uh, we then moved our infrared counters. We got a minimum of seven days of monitoring at each of the 80 sites uh, throughout uh, the 80 mile trail network. Um, and then what we were able to do is use this method to factor and to develop an AADT, or an average annual daily trail traffic, for each of the trail segments. And you can see those in, uh, in the map. In the, in the map with the bubbles, it shows us the, uh, the, 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 the volumes at that site. We've, we've mapped those on the road segments in the other ones. And you can see where there's the highest traffic. The highest traffic is downtown over the, uh, the Stone Arch Bridge. Uh, adjacent to uh, the commercial districts, uh, retail districts, financial districts, and then you see the large volumes around the lakes. Um, that makes sense. You see some evidence of increasing flow for commuting towards downtown. And in North Minneapolis, uh, where there are a number of orphan trails that don't go anywhere, you see the, low, the smallest volumes. There are also the fewest destinations. And so this gives us inference here. Now, the, the innovation here is that we have an estimate of AADT, average annual daily traffic, for a, tr a network um, where none existed before. The park board had never any estimate like this. Um, and it gives us a second uh, performance measure. When we, if we believe that these estimates of average annual daily traffic are representative of the street segment, we estimate that there's over 28 million miles traveled on this network uh, in a given year. This is analogous to what we do for vehicles. The question is, how do you extrapolate that? Because most, you know, we are, this is the easiest thing to work with because it's a defined network, a shared use path. The question is then how do we work with the street network? And even more complex is how do we deal with sidewalks and pedestrian traffic? Because that's where most of it occurs. But the idea here was to, to see if using these, these technologies that now are available, we could replicate the process used with vehicles. And this is a promising result. Now one of the things we found out is that we don't have the right reference sites. Because the idea here is we want to have a reference site that represents all the different type of traffic patterns that exist. And if you remember, down in here, the Southwest Court, that looks like all our reference sites. We'll call that mixed recreation and utilitarian because you see a slight morning peak, a late afternoon peak on the weekdays, and sort of an even throughout the day. You, you look at this. People get up early during the week. They go to work. There's a slight peak around 7 or 8 o'clock. It's more or less even. Then up through the evening through 6 o'clock, when people are commuting home or exercising after work, you see this max this work. On the weekends, people go out later in the day and they stop using the trails earlier in the day. And all six of our reference sites look like that. But if you look just above it, utilitarian, this represents, for example, the, the Stinson Creek. That's a clear, much more of a utilitarian site where you have people coming to campus in the morning and night and, and it's not used recreationally very much. And you have other sites that are purely recreational with not much evidence of commuting. And so if we want to maximize accuracy in extrapolation, we want to use factors developed from sites that match the actual sites at the characteristics. So what we, if we were 
continuing this, what we try to do is establish reference sites at both recreational and utilitarian so we can have factor groups that match what's going on. So we learned a fair amount through this, this experiment last summer. So what do we learn? The traffic volumes are significant. They vary a lot. We have systematic error that we need to account for in any of our counting devices. Our mode mix varies substantially across locations. We have patterns that we can, we can exploit to understand and use to extrapolate. Uh, those patterns vary across location. We have a different method for trying to reduce error and extrapolation. We can get miles traveled on a trail network. And that gives us ideas, for example, we can, um, we can, we can do a screening test if we wanted to look at every site with peak hour traffic more than a certain volume entering an intersection. For example, we're starting to get data that helps us at some general level. Some limitations, if we want to use these day of year factors, and we, we might want to end up applying, we can only apply those retrospectively. Um, we think we would like to have better reference sites. We may want to reassess where our segment breaks. Now that we have volumes for every mile, we can see whether we can get rid of some segments because flows are consistent, but we may need to break some up if we want to improve those sort of estimates. This is something that's done with vehicle traffic all the time. We, may, we need to work on different factors for different modes. Again, that's mixed mode traffic, uh, so that's a limitation. We can do things like identify high exposure intersections. So that's one approach. It's heavily reliant on counts and moving our technologies around. Another approach, looking at modeling demand from another street, will do these facility demand models, and this is another approach that we've experimented with. Let's say that we have a set of counts, and we want to think of the traffic volumes as a function of the neighborhood's sociodemographics around it, the built environment, accessibility to jobs, the transportation infrastructure that it's connected to, and things like weather. So we're going to use a different data set here to experiment with another approach. Um, the city of Minneapolis, for several years, uh, has done manual two-hour peak hour counts in May and, and September of each year uh, at a number of locations. This model was estimated in uh, around 2011 using data from 2007 through 2010. At that point, they had done these two-hour counts at a couple hundred locations across the city. They have separate bike and ped counts. Um, some of those are on these shared use trails. Some of them are 12 hour counts, others are two. They have 450 counts at that point uh, total. And so what we did with this, this data set is we took each of those counts as, a de as the dependent variable and we tried to estimate that volume as a function of these types of characteristics. And we did separate models for bikes and peds. And this uh, th this, this comes from a paper that was in the Journal of Landscape and Urban Planning. And what we're trying to do here is look at factors that are associated with it. So for example, with the bicycle map models, uh, we found higher volumes at locations that were in neighborhoods with higher uh, percentage of college educated people, with a greater land use mix, which represents destinations for people to go to, and that were connected to off-street trails or bike paths. For the pedestrian models, we saw larger volumes in, in neighborhoods where there was a higher proportion of non-white individuals, higher proportion of college, and that were both arterials and collectors. So we see more people on our arterial and collector streets. What we're able to do then is uh, collect data for the rest of the city and then extrapolate and estimate uh, what we think, you know, are these, are, these are first generation estimates of bike and ped traffic on different streets, and you can see both uh, some of this makes sense. So, for example, on the bike traffic, we pick up the Midtown Greenway. However, we don't pick up as much as we should around the lake traffic. So we've just showed you that that's, that's wrong. For ped traffic, we see clusters downtown, which makes sense because that's where there's a lot of walking. And we wanted, wondered how, how good these are. So we looked at model validation. So we used data from 2007 through 2000, uh, I think, 9 to predict 10. And you can see that uh, if we use, we're using negative binomial models, um, they, work, they work much better. But we don't do a very good job of predicting peaks on unusual days. So uh, there's still work to be done to develop these types of demand models. Um, they require counts as inputs. I think they're useful for uh, beginning planning, understanding system. They aren't causal. And we need to work with those more, obtain more data. So this is another approach that sort of as a foundation for the work going forward. 
Now, in the intervening time that those two work has been done, there's been new work going on in Minneapolis and Hennepin County. They've been collecting additional data. Uh, they're doing manual counts, new locations. They're implementing automated counts. We can exposure. So, for example, this is these are the number of locations at Minneapolis downtown, an example of the counts where they're, they're continuing to count. Minneapolis has increased the number of count places where it does two-hour counts from about 250 to more than 450. So we have a, a, a better geographic coverage. And we want to ultimately link that with crash data. So here's a summary from the city of Minneapolis for where crashes have occurred. And so part of the new RSI project will begin to build on what we've learned with counting, build on what we've learned with modeling, and begin to try to uh, link that to crash data. So our next steps are these. Um, we want to confirm the communities where we'll be working. Uh, one will be Minneapolis, Hennepin County, because there's rich data sets. There are people in Duluth who are interested in participating, perhaps Mankato if we're a, a smaller community. And we have commitments in Bemidji and Grand Marais to begin um, doing additional, more intensive work. So over the next couple of years, we'll be looking at these, in part because of the smaller communities, as they're largely have, have been understudied. Most of the work that you see for bike and pet analysis coming out is at these, um, is at, at larger cities. We want to work with these jurisdictions to develop and implement monitoring plans. We want to work with them working on models. And the goal, again, is to move forward with trying to understand exposure to risk. Um, the objective here, again, is to further what uh, and support state policies that encourage uh, non-motorized transportation as a way of making our um, transportation system more complete. And I'll stop there, I think. Thank you. Dr. Lindsay. And let me see if anybody has any initial questions. Uh, for those of us in the room, make sure that you get the microphone from me so that our remote participants can hear. And Kylie, I'm assuming you'll flag me down if there's a question from our remote participants. Great. Questions? Yeah, Greg. <clears throat> One of the things you mentioned was uh, the challenge in expanding this methodology to the street network and uh -huh. getting off the trails here. And just as an anecdote, you know, I remember my favorite uh, left turn phase at a nearby intersection for decades. It ignored me every time I was in the uh, left turn lane, and I'd have to wait for a car to trip the uh, detector uh -huh. or run through the red light. Uh, and then for one summer, it seemed like uh, that detector recognized my bicycle, okay, when I was there and would give me the uh, green to turn here. And then after a while, it went away. Uh -huh. So. It seemed like the sensitivity had been adjusted to actually recognize a bike for a while here. So could you just comment on maybe the potential of using the existing street detector network here to uh, supplement your methodology? Yeah, the people have explored that in a variety of different ways. The problem historically has been the, the lack of sensitivity. You couldn't get that. I, I was on a bike last night at um, Jefferson and, and uh, Fairview, and they, they painted on it put your bike here so it'll activate the site. So I, I think that there is promise going forward, but I think it will be some time before we can move to that. People be, another, another area that's related to that, um, there's research going on now at Portland State where they're using pedestrian actuation signals to get an idea of not the count, but sort of an index, because it would be a, a clearly an undercount. They only record each one of those to do the same type of thing. So I think that that's another line of research that people are taking, um, um, but we haven't assembled those data here yet. Any other questions? Other questions? Greg, I have a question. Could sure. you talk a little bit about, probably in particular, the loops and the tubes, how they work with a fabulous Minnesota winter of snow and ice? I don't know if it's as applicable to the infrared, depending on how high they're mounted, but I'm assuming that the stuff that's on or in the pavements there are is concerned. The tubes are not used in the winter. The, 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 the tubes are only used in the, uh, in the summertime because snow plows and other things tear them up. And also, there's been research that shows, uh, particularly for bikes and peds, that you minimize accuracy when you when you extrapolate from counts taken during the 
the, the months with the largest volume. And, and that's typically here April through October. Nordback showed that, and, then, and that, that was another piece of Steve Hankey's work. And so that's, a limit, that's, that's uh, seasonality there. In terms of the inductive loops in the road, uh, we'll find that out. Okay, because they were there, we have data. Um, they've just been in this year, and when we look at data at the end of the year, we'll have a better understanding of that. One of the challenges there um, is that the bike volumes are so low in the winter. Uh, like on Central Avenue, where the inductive loops are, they were put in in November, and the counts are you know five or ten a day, and so it's very difficult to assess accuracy when you only have that number, and so. Uh, you know, we made the decision not to put out videos during then to try to validate those and wait till a period when there's larger counts. Um, different infrared devices have different levels of accuracy. The, the active infrared that involve breaking a beam, um, typically they're within 10, 15 percent, sometimes less. Passive infrared that senses temperature differential um, typically uh, have a little bit greater error. And they may be affected by backroom temperature and other factors. So you have to match the technology to the site. Other questions? Anything online? OK, great. Thank you, Professor, Professor Lindsay. Let me end with just a couple of comments. Uh, for those of you who might be collecting PDH hours, see Kylie. She has a form for us. Next week, uh, Professor Ray Benekahal from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign will be our guest speaker. However, he is going to be on campus at UIUC. And so for those of you who are students participating in the series, you are not required to come in person to, the, to this room next week. But if you want credit for uh, counting the seminar as one of the 10 they have, you have to attend, thank you, <laughs> make sure you sign in and watch online next week. For those of you who might attend in person, it's up to you. We will be here in the room, but we will be broadcasting the presentation. You're free to join online as well. And if you are participating online and you didn't sign in using that comment bubble at the beginning, please do so before we sign off here. Kylie, did I forget anything? Because I forgot my notes. So, <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you next week or see you online next week. Thank you, Stephanie.